I'm here today uh, with Chantel Barber, and she's in Tennessee and uh, in the United States. And I, I was impressed with her work that I saw over the internet and how um, big and bold and luscious it was. And uh, Chantel has uh, agreed to come on today and just talk to her about what goes on in her head when she paints. And uh, Chantel? Yes. <laughs> it's wonderful to be on today and be able to talk with you. Oh, awesome. I appreciate that. Well, um, like I said, I was just, I was so impressed with the way that uh, you painted and, and I looked on your website and uh, I, I, are you using acrylics? Is that what it is? I work in acrylic. And um, you, your marks are very uh, large and big and bold. Um, what are you using to accomplish this? I guess, you know, like a lot of those artists you've seen, they'll pull out that, the smallest paintbrush because they want to get all that detail. I'm thinking you'd probably go the other direction. I do. I try to use the largest paintbrush possible, even when I'm doing the small paintings. And I do that because, and when I use the acrylic, I actually use the heavy body acrylic because I want it to maintain those brush strokes. And if you use a softer body acrylic, you're, it's going to shrink when it dries, and you're going to lose those uh, wonderful brush strokes that you get. I saw that you, um, so, so you're using, what's a heavier body or acrylic for uh, those of us that don't know what that is? The, the heavy body, the soft body is more of a, a liquid. If you pour it out, it's great for if you want to do uh, a lot of line work and uh, more of a watercolor feel. Right. Heavy body acrylic has got a, what I call it, it, the texture is similar to an oil paint. Not quite the same, but very similar, and it allows you to pick that paintbrush or pick the paint up on the paintbrush and it's not going to drip off. And I feel it gives the artist more control, especially for the type of paintings that, that I want. To uh, okay. So is it something that you add to your paints or just the paints that you choose? It's the paints I choose and what I, I don't like to add mediums to the oh, okay. I do like to use a palette though that keeps the paints moist and workable so that I can continue to, to mix and put colors on the palette throughout an entire painting session. So you constantly like misting your palette to keep it wet or is it? It has a sponge and I put water in the sponge and then the paper goes on top of the sponge and so it's absorbing a little bit of that moisture throughout the, the painting session. So what kind of tools are you using and what are you thinking when you're putting that? I know this that you did a lot of figure painting. What are you thinking when you, what goes through your head when you're starting to paint a child or whoever you pick? Well, first of all, years ago when I started acrylic, I was told, oh, you can't use acrylic for portraits or you can't use acrylic for figures. This was back in the early 90s and a lot of people were using acrylic mainly for abstract. And I remember at the time thinking, oh, but I want to paint the, the portraits and I want to do the figures and I, I want to do it in a looser, impressionistic style. I don't want to paint abstracts. And so I decided to ignore <laughs> what they were telling me. And it became kind of this process of experimenting throughout the years and, and looking for the paints and looking for surfaces that would work and the brushes. And what I find one big thing is to limit the use of water. I don't use a lot of water in my process. Even when I'm working with my paintbrush, I'm not dipping it in water in between colors. I, if I need to leave it for a minute, I wrap it in a paper towel and put it to the side so it doesn't dry out. But I don't wash the brushes until I'm done with that painting session. So, so when you're going from color to color and not even <laughs> washing your brush out, you're just wiping it out on a paper towel yeah. or... What do you use, cotton cloth, is that what you use? I love the white cotton towels. I have a whole bunch of them. I've got a basket filled with them, they're all rolled up. And I love that because I can control how much paint goes on my paintbrush. If I want a heavy amount of paint, right. I go right on there. But there are certain passages in my paintings where I just want the tiniest bit of color 
to go on that canvas. And so what I'll do is I'll load my paintbrush with the paint and then wipe just the hair of it off on those towels so that when I go to apply it to the canvas, I'm getting the exact amount of paint I want in the spot where I want it to be. Yeah, I, I think that's really true. I, I was talking to an artist the other day and it's, you don't know how much is behind making that brush stroke. A lot of people think, okay, now when I put the paint down and then something magical happens when it hits the canvas, but there's a, a lot of prep before that mark even goes down. Like you say, you're adjusting on your paintbrush how much um, medium is there and what the consistency of the medium is. And, uh, and then you're very intentional. This isn't something that's like crazy happening here. It's like there's this thought process and you're going through that. So when, when you're doing that, like, I mean, I, for me, and I like this little psychological part, but like I can almost relate some of the things I experienced as, as a child and playing with painting and getting my hands into it and just loving to smear it around and, and see what happens with it on canvas. What kind of things are you feeling and experiencing when you're applying the paint? What goes through your head? First thing was to get rid of the fear factor. Because I found that in my own you know, artistic life, I would be afraid to lay strokes down. And it was that what if, oh, what if it doesn't look good? What if this is, you know, isn't going to look right? Or what? And what I realized, the wonderful thing about acrylic is if I put something down and it doesn't look right, I can lift it back up without it damaging the underpainting that I've already done. And when I was able to let go of that fear and know that, I could experiment and try different strokes, and if they didn't look right, simply wipe it off. That opened up a whole new world for me. And so now I find that I am just thrilled to see, what if I tried to put paint on with a paper towel? What if I tried to do it with my palette knife and then manipulate it with the edge of a brush or manipulate it with a paper towel? And so I'm using several different tools to not only apply my brush strokes, but also to, I'm thinking about the paint texture and the paint application and trying to vary it throughout a painting. Yeah, that, that's really interesting. Uh, you, you kind of figure it out as with a computer, you had that undo, you know, control uh, Z, re, redo the last thing you do. So you're doing that with your paintings and, and you got rid of the fear factor, which was, what if I do something that's gonna ruin my painting? or you know, not be what I want. But so are you, are you using it water and, and a paper towel at that point to lift it off or? A, a damp paper towel. It's okay. just got a little bit of water on it. And all I need to do is just lift up that one offensive stroke. What I tell people when I am, am teaching is this, look at what you love in your painting. And, and this is what I do. I look at what I love and I don't touch those areas. I don't go back and I don't continue to say, oh, you know, what if I did this or what if I did that? Because I've learned I will lose the effect. But I focus on the areas I'm not happy with. And it used to be, and I hate to even admit this, but it used to be more of a, oh, woe is me. I didn't, this is an awful painting because I couldn't fix this or I couldn't fix that. And then one day it dawned on me, well, why can't I fix those areas I'm not happy with? All I need to do is focus on those and the passages I am happy with need to be left alone. No, that, that's a good thought. That's a, a very um, comforting thought for those people that, which is all of us, <laughs> struggle with uh, what to do with those parts of our painting that uh, are ruining the painting, possibly, you know, making it a success or a, a failure. So, um, so what types of things do you like to paint? Um, I mean, I actually want to get back to that one question. What goes through your mind when you're applying the paint as far as what, what's, how, how does that feel to you when you're wiping or putting that paint on? I love to paint people. That is, is my favorite thing. I do enjoy landscapes. I do enjoy still life. But people, I have been drawing people since I was four years old. I've got tons of pictures, tons of crayon things. When I go to paint a person, in, in my, what I'm thinking about when I'm painting them and I'm applying the paint is capturing that beauty that I see in front of me, trying to pull out that, there's something 
alive in the person. There's that human spirit. Right. What I noticed was um, my husband's grandmother, she had Alzheimer's. And as she went through that and could not remember things, the personality in her face disappeared. She wasn't the person that I knew. And that made an impression on me because I realized it's not just about getting features down. It is about capturing that human spirit and trying to put that into paint. And so many times it's maybe doing a little bit more of a caricature of someone's features. When I lay paint spots down, I try to always keep a feeling of movement because we're alive. We're always moving, even if someone is still. So I will deliberately let a brush stroke you know, perhaps go outside the line, so to speak. <laughs> to try to get that feeling of movement and to capture that beauty in that person. Um, you know, we live in a world where beauty is very clearly defined, who's beautiful and who isn't. And what I find is it doesn't matter what the person looks like who is my model that I'm painting. I can see beauty in all of them, just the way their features work together, mm -hmm. the, the you know, way that they might tilt their head or have one side of their mouth higher than the other. There are beautiful things, and I, I like to be able to get that in the paint and get it on the, the surface. And sometimes that means even having a um, thick and thin contrast. Some areas have thicker passages of paint. Other areas have thin passages of paint because maybe I am trying to show someone who has, uh, let's say, a, a, you know, very thick hair and trying to add areas there, but yet in another passage, maybe on a net, having very little paint there to try to show the, the contrast. Yeah, I, I like what you said. I thought that was uh, um, very good. I, I, I also believe that, you know, people, we sense more than just the visual, you know. I mean, we're, we're sensing so much more, like, like you said, the spirit, and we are painting that. And uh, capturing all that is uh, what makes a, a good painting always. And uh, you've seen people that might make it look right, but there's something missing. And that's the heart or the spirit of the painter, I believe, that, that you were talking to. And then to the other point that you made, I was fascinated. I, I probably know sometimes more about dead artists than I do live artists. But So I was reading about Rembrandt. And you know how fascinating Rembrandt's paintings are. Uh, mostly he did uh, self-portraits. And he was the master of light. And he considered himself a very homely man, a homely person, a homely appearance. But the paintings he did of himself, he was no longer homely because he caught his spirit. He caught the illumination of light. And they became this grand person. So, yeah, uh, beauty is only skin deep. And then as painters, uh, I guess we have to uncover the rest. Mm -hmm. So that's good. I like that. Well, I, and I like the idea of motion through paintings. I, I think, you know, a lot of times people think because these are flat and stagnant paintings, there isn't motion in them. But design and movement of the eye and motion is very important. Uh, those big marks that you break down, I mean, they're not just a big mark, they're put down in such a, an eloquent way that they you know, describe something. Um, so how, how do you determine where you want those big strokes versus where you want your smaller strokes? Is there some kind of planning process you go through? or There is. Um when I was younger, I used to wonder how one painting would turn out of mine and another painting wouldn't turn out. And it was almost like, ooh, there's some magical touch. You know, everything just came together in the right way and this is a good painting and this isn't a good painting. But then it started to dawn on me, and this is what you said earlier, I have to be intentional about what I'm doing. And I have to really think about why I'm putting paint in certain areas. And so what I will do is I will get a painting uh, locked in, and then I step back from it over and over again. Even if I'm only working on a four by four inch painting, I step back and I, I like to call it, I'm reading the painting. And I see how is it reading from a distance and how much more information does it need 
to read the way I want it to. For example, if I'm trying to get a person's shoulder to look like it's up, how many more marks do I need to give that illusion that it's turning without too many mm -hmm. details? And so I'm always looking to see, does this uh, give, if a viewer were to come up to it, do they have that feeling of the hand, you know, curving around or the face tilted? And however many marks it, it needs to create that without taking it too detailed. And sometimes it's painting one or two large strokes, but in my mind I'm thinking about the paintbrush going around the form. Mm -hmm. Not flat to me. I'm always envisioning that the person's in front of me. And well, if your head's turned back, then you've got to bring the brush stroke a certain way to capture that feeling of the form. So, so are you working from models or, or from crafts or both? I'm working from model, live models sometimes, and then other times I'll go and I'll, I'll do a photo shoot mm -hmm. with the models. Yeah. You can't Pretty much from always from someone that I have uh, either hired to sit or, you know, I uh, hired to go out and get photographs from. But then again, there's other opportunities where there is a public event going on and people are more than happy to let you photograph them if they're dressed up in costumes or and mm -hmm. what I try to do then is hang around that person that I've taken a picture of for you know maybe 10 to 15 minutes even and watch their body language watch kind of the way they interact and really that gives me enough information to go home and then use my photo reference. And especially, I'm looking at the light. I'm looking at how is the light hitting their face, or if it's a figure, how is it, there? How is it fitting emotions? And I, looking at that, is it the wonderful feeling of the light filtering through maybe some leaves up ahead and it's creating this beautiful pattern on their face? Or is it that you know there's a pattern going down maybe one side of the body versus the other. And I, I try to make these mental notations so that when I get back to the easel, I don't forget what it was like at that moment. Yeah, that I was, yeah, that, that was the thought going through my head uh, when you were talking. Uh, when talking is, is, um, um, <laughs> when, when I, when, when I, See like an like image or something or happening. happening. I, 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 I hold that thought, that in, thought my, in my mind, mind for a certain amount of time. Certain amount of time. But if it, too much, it, time too passes, much time passes, I lose it. I lose it. Mm -hmm. And, um, and um, how long do you think, how long do you think to retain, to retain the idea or the, the idea or the concept? From the time you the time you experience experience it, it, to the time you get it done. Time you get it done. That's a good question. It depends on what the situation was. For example, what I with my own children, I have found that there are events that happened within, let's say, you know, ten years ago, and I had a photograph and I wasn't able to paint at that moment. But if it was a memorable moment and I remember on the beach how the light was and how when I looked out at them, the, their skin was so white against the color of the ocean or something like that. I find that I can retain those memories mainly because I have that visual. When I look at it, it brings it all back. Right. Right. Um, just a passion to never stop learning. The more I paint, the more I realize I don't know and the more I want to learn and I want every painting to be better than the one I just did before.